could still be guiding us. He could still be helping us. He could be renouncing his control of his keys, but he's not, which means he's either a bitch or he's dead. Those are the only two options I'm aware of. Now, as okay, far as so let, let's say, let's say I can see to every point that you just made there, sure. um, which I don't necessarily do, but just for argument's sake, sure. um, that didn't answer my question at all. My, my question okay. was, we have, you know, a nine year track record of exactly what worked incredibly well to grow Bitcoin from nothing to where we are today. And that was right. having fast, cheap, easy to use transactions and let the blocks grow from 10 kilobytes to 20 kilobytes to 50 kilobytes, all the way on up to one megabyte. And yeah. it wasn't until we hit the one megabyte limit that the adoption rate trailed off and Bitcoin started losing market share right. to competing cryptocurrencies and the user experience became horrible. So we have so, the empirical evidence with a nine year track yeah. record could have worked well. Why wouldn't we follow on that same course? Right. Why are we changing courses so, to something that may I or may addressed. not work? And we have no empirical evidence of it. I understand. Well, you're never going to, you're not going to have a lot of imperial evidence and uh, empirical evidence in crypto because we just got here. So we're working with limited empirical evidence on nearly any single thing that we do. This is all cutting edge stuff. And on the but cutting edge. We have edge, nine years track record for, for how we grew Bitcoin sure. from, from nothing yeah. to where it is today. So you're cherry picking two things. First, you're cherry picking that fees are the reason other cryptos did well. Basically, like robbing those cryptos of any other mimetic advantage or technical advantage or marketing team advantage. You're just saying Bitcoin had high fees and that's the only reason these other cryptos became valuable. If you so talk to, to be the fair, I, that, I think if I can add what exactly mm -hmm. my argument is, the fees are a side effect. What I think really caused the other cryptocurrencies to take off was when Bitcoin blocks became full, you no longer had certainty that your transaction was going to be confirmed. And the uncertainty of when your transaction is going to go through is an even bigger problem than the high fees. So I think you know, I get to see support I, I, tickets from lots of I, businesses. I wouldn't be surprised if you pumped the value of those coins. I mean, you you what, what coins? cash be brought into the world, a 20% pre-mined, in, impossible to detect inflation altcoin. You funded that, right? So in so, to some degree, you're like... Yeah, and I, I can tell you the reason for that, though, is the everyone's busy arguing over Bitcoin scalability and how to scale Bitcoin at the moment. But the big, giant other problem that's looming for Bitcoin is fungibility. Uh, Bitcoin is not nearly as fungible as it needs to be. And fungibility is just another, you know, friendlier sounding name for anonymity, right? The more private Bitcoin is, the better the money uh, it is. And that's another area that's really, really lacking with Bitcoin. And small blocks make that problem worse. Uh, when governments or whoever are trying to search for transactions, they're looking for a needle in a haystack. We want them to be looking in a needle for in a great big giant haystack rather than a little tiny one megabyte haystack. So uh, yeah, they can't. that's another problem that's caused by yeah. small blocks. I, look, I, I agree with that. And if it wasn't 20% pre-mined, and if it had detectable inflation that you could detect if the coin broke, I would have been happy to fund it too. But, you know, uh, those two things are deal breaker for me. Anyway, okay. so my, my the, point the is... Nice part about... Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so my, my point is a lot of rich crypto guys are the reason that those things had a spike to make them interesting, to give other people in the normal public a reason to find them more interesting. Look, we both agree we want lower fees. So let's just talk about fees, right? Okay, because the, so, the core team disagrees with, with both of us on that, then if, if you're saying you want lower For a very specific reason. So I said that you cherry picked the reason that uh, we lost market share. Now I'm gonna say what that you're cherry- What do you think the reason is? Well, right now, all those other things don't perform any commerce functions. So if it was really a replacement good, as you advertise, then it would be used as a replacement. But Bitcoin shares no utility replacement value with the pump and dump ICOs. There is no retail adoption. There are no retail wallets. These people don't even take the coins off exchange. If the I think other you're conflating ICOs with other competing cryptos. And I'll, I'll give you an example from my, my own life. So there's a website called bitcart.io that I used to love to buy Amazon gift cards from uh, with Bitcoin for and that. You would get a 15% discount for Amazon gift cards using Bitcoin. And as of, I don't know, maybe a month or two ago, when the network became really, really full, they stopped accepting Bitcoin and they only uh, were accepting, I believe, Dash and Ethereum. And so that's a real world use case of businesses right. shifting away from Bitcoin to competing altcoins, you're, which I think are different than I see. Right. You're hundred percent right. The increase in fees prices Bitcoin out of a lot of markets. And even though you're 100% right, the amount of dollars and liquidity and pump that comes from actual retail darknet market usage and you, the number one Bitcoin user in the world's usage, is like 3 to 5% of the total market cap. 
So you're right. There, anyone that actually does do Bitcoin commerce, which is almost nobody, might have to really, switch to currencies. I really disagree that there's not many people using Bitcoin for commerce. And anybody can, can take a look at just how many people are using Bitcoin for commerce by going over to blockchain.info and watch the transactions scrolling by. Those are real people using Bitcoin to real, move real amounts of money around the world. And we don't necessarily know what they're using it for. But if you see it moving, there's some sort of economic activity going on behind it. Uh, at $5 a transaction or $8 a transaction, they're not moving it just for fun. They're doing it because they're performing some sort of economic activity with it. If you wanted to buy a car with Bitcoin, there was one company in the States that had scale. They went out of business. There's maybe one or two small like shops like near uh, Butterfly Labs in Kansas City. There was a shop that like accepted Bitcoin. There's maybe one in California, maybe one in Florida. Like I love Bitcoin as much as the next guy, but I'm not willing to pretend that it's not a thousand times less places you can spend it. And I'm being generous with a thousand. It's probably a hundred thousand. I think you're, you're really missing the, the picture. There's more than 200,000 merchants uh, in Japan that accept Bitcoin. I can walk down the street to the electronic store and use Bitcoin in the store. I can walk down to the street to the equivalent of uh, like Macy's or something in the U.S., and spin Bitcoin here in Japan. Uh, there's all sorts of restaurants. There's all sorts of stuff. There's all sorts of websites. I book more hotels on Expedia in Bitcoin, you know, than I can count each year. Uh, there's a huge amount of commerce that's being used uh, with with the Bitcoin network, and the fact that it costs eight dollars per transaction to do it, and yet the blocks are still completely full, shows just how big of a demand there is for people to use Bitcoin in, in real world commerce. All right. So you think there's a lot of commerce? Maybe in Japan there is. I don't think there's a lot. We'll move on. Um, Do you have a theory as to why people would be moving the you know bitcoins at eight dollars per transaction if they're not doing commerce with it? Why why are they spending eight dollars, uh, you know, every time they move bitcoin and it's well, because all it's the not, blocks are completely full? What are they doing if it's not commerce? Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's the whole idea is we're not supposed it's to know. commerce. People are using bitcoin to pay people all over the world. And when the network became full and the user experience became not as good as it used to be with Bitcoin, people started exploring uh, alternatives like, you know, Dash and, and Monero and, and Ethereum yep. and things like that. Yeah. And, and that's a direct result you know of, what? of There's other alternatives too, blocks. like Visa and MasterCard and Swift. Yeah. And right. people are using that sometimes now instead of Bitcoin, whereas previously yep. they would have used Bitcoin. Yeah. So a real we, we agree we'd both like to see Bitcoin fees be very low and that everyone accept it and use it. We're both on the same point there, right? So you know the Blockstream team want the exact opposite. They openly say they want Bitcoin fees to be high. They want Bitcoin transactions to be easy to double spend. And they want the blocks to be full all the time, which leads to uncertainty as to when a transaction is going to be confirmed on the right. network. So you and I want the same thing. Yep. Those guys want the exact opposite. Why would you be supporting their roadmap for the future of Bitcoin? Because they're not a monolith and there's interior conflict amongst their ranks. Let me give you an example. Please. Uh, Greg Maxwell He's all right with the one megabyte limit. Luke Jr., he's not. He says we only get 17% more processing per year, but the blockchain grows faster than that. So he wants to knock it down to 300. No one else on the team agrees with that, right? So Luke Jr. is on his own, you know, with tonal uh, numbering and uh, his 300 and kilobyte limit. Geocentric theory, and right. he's on his own you know, with a lot of things. He's on his own with a lot of stuff, right? So the majority of developers do not agree with him on the, I won't say majority, but his most public controversial opinions, all right? Now, but I, I do think that for the most part, there's consensus among the block streaming core developers that they want to have a fee market right now that creates high fees. Well, I can explain it to you. I'm going, going to. Like, I've prepared for this. Okay, so, I'm ready. You are correct that you could have lower fees with larger blocks now. You would get more of the same problem, which when you cherry picked, you missed out on, which was the centralization what, what problem is that? causing empty blocks. The centralization is the result of the block sizes being what they are. The so bigger they a, get, the more empty I blocks like to, get mined and the more centralization like exists. So the empty blocks are actually just a way of the network slowing down so that everybody can keep up. So the reason an empty block takes place is one, one pool finds a block and then the other pools that are spy mining on it, they see the header 
and they can start mining on the header right away until they have received the entire block and they validated that block. Then they can toss a bunch more transactions in there and, and mine a block that has a bunch of transactions. So the fact that one full block is found here and then, you know, two seconds later.